Rabbi Lord Sachs, Salam Aleichem, how are you? Aleichem Shalom, Baruch Hashem. You know, in this wonderfully electronically mediated isolation, it still feels like isolation to me, but it's really great that we're able to communicate and great to see you smiling. Absolutely. And uh, please tell me how's Elaine, how your children, your grandchildren during these very difficult times? Elaine is doing absolutely fine and keeping very f- because she goes for a walk every day and that's great. Uh, our children and grandchildren, our Kanena Har, are lovely. They are all Zoom literate. <laughs> so, um, they're really good at communicating and they've been absolutely sweet. Really, really sweet. Oh, that's terrific. And uh, I'm finding now from everything that I see and from what I hear that during these difficult times, I'm seeing that religiosity is on the increase that people are digging deep to discover their spiritual roots. I believe uh, there is an opportunity here for us. How are you seeing things? You know, um, when Hasidim go and see a rabbi, they call it Yechidus, you know, Yechidut, being alone with. And I think over these weeks, I don't know whether you felt this, but certainly I felt it, that we've had it, been having a yechidu with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with God himself. It's kind of different language, you know, when you're praying in private, it's a different kind of language to when you're praying in public. It's very intense. I've certainly felt that Sefer Tehillim, the Book of Psalms, has become an absolute indispensable aid to the spirit. I've also found that music has been very uplifting as well. So I think we've been exploring aspects of spirituality, which very often we don't have time for. And over these last few weeks, we've almost had an excess of time for, and it's been, it's been quite good for the soul. Yeah, and, and you're talking about Yechidot. Coming up now to Chag Shavuot, which will be a Chag Shavuot like none other, uh, in terms of Yechidot, that's Moshe Rabbeinu experienced when he was on Har Sinai, when the Torah was given. He had the absolute yichidot of just himself alone with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But I'm also mindful of the fact that there was the Vayichan, the people were united yeah. at the foot of the mountain. And I think we're experiencing both things at one at the same time because there's a very precious sense of unity right now. While separated, people do certainly feel connected. But at the same time, we will need to go through the Chag by ourselves alone. Yeah. There is, a, uh, there is a line of Midrash that relates Psalm 29 that we sing before Luchod, um to the giving of the Torah, you know, Kol Hashem Kol, you know, all the Shiva Kol, the seven voices with which the Torah was given. And one of the phrases of that Psalm is Kol Hashem uh, the voice of God with, I don't know what Koach means, it means strength, but it also means potential. And the Midrash says, Bekoach kol echad ve'echad. Everyone received the revelation at Sinai in their own terms. They each interpreted it slightly differently. So I think everyone had a Yechidus with Hashem at Mount Sinai. And that's probably why the Maharsha says that, you know, the Chazal say there's 70 faces of Torah. The Maharsha says there are 
600,000 faces of Torah because each of us has one little bit aspect of the Torah, one perspective, one little bit of the Bakoach that no one else has. So maybe we will recap recapture something of that this year. Yeah, absolutely. And on Bakoach itself, Kol Hashem Bakoach, Koach of course is 28 and Yad is 14 because of the 14 joints in each hand. Yad gives us Yadid, friendship. Yeah. Yadid is 14 and 14, 28, meaning that the greatest Koach comes from Yadidot, a sense of togetherness. So, Kol Hashem Bakach, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is strengthened when we are strengthened yeah. togetherness. So certainly, Kol Echad Vechad separately and togetherness. And I think over this Shavuot, the two will come together. I'm also sensing that as we're passing through these very dark clouds, there is a silver lining begging to be noticed uh, and to be taken advantage of. And as we're looking now, to emerge from this very challenging period. I think there's a lot of room of, for hope. What are your thoughts? You know, um, uh, Rabbi Lam, former president of Yushu University, once used to say to me, um, he only knows one joke in the Mishnah. <laughs> and I said, well, what's that? And he said, you know, Tamilei Chachamim Marbim Shalom Ba'olam. Rabbis increase peace in the world, eh? you know, and he said, you, we all know the more rabbis, the more rounds. And I said, Rabbi Lamb, I don't think it's a joke. It's just that you got to get to the end of the sentence. And the sentence says, Don't call them your children, but call them your builders. People build, they make peace. The only time the Israelites were really at peace were when they were building the tabernacle. When this is over, we are going to have at every level, social, economic, industrial, financial, a job of rebuilding. And when people build, they come together. So I think it's going to be a difficult time, but it's going to be an incredibly rewarding time because you know as we endeavor to build our communities and endeavor to rebuild their businesses they will never forget that time because something momentous about it and something invigorating very uniting about it yeah and certainly what i'm mindful of is that ever since 1945 we've been in the post-war era as from 2020 we'll be in the post-virus era and we ourselves now have the opportunity to set a tone for the generations to come within the Jewish world and globally as well. And within the Jewish world, it's at a time such as this coming towards Shavuot. People will remember, already people are remembering that one of Pesach. Please God, it'll be one of. We won't have to repeat it next year. To be this unique Shavuot and having the opportunity, two of us, to share Divrei Torah together and to share them with thousands of others at the same time. I feel very privileged to have that opportunity together with so many others who right now are spreading Divrei Torah in a most marvelous way. So I'd like to thank you, Rabbi Lord Sachs, for joining me for this opportunity. We've been set a task together to speak about a life of vertical and horizontal responsibility, Shavuot, during the coronavirus epidemic. You'll be giving a shiur, following which I'll be giving my shiur. And it's now my great pleasure to invite you, Rabbi Lord Sachs, to deliver Thank your you shiur. Thank you so much. And bless you, Chief Rabbi, and bless all you do. I hope your family, Valor, and all the children, and your wonderful grandchildren. It's been a very, very hard year for you, a year of avelutiv, of mourning. So, now, Shem, wipe all the tears off your brow and give you and your family safety, good health, and many, many and blessings and to you this year and years to come. Your dear family. Thank you. Okay, so what I wanted to do with this year is to talk about the coronavirus because terror gets very interesting. You relate them to the things that are constantly changing. Now, as the chief rabbi has already said, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has enforced a situation that seems to be exactly the opposite of the situation at Mount Sinai. We have three indications of that in the Torah pretty well explicitly. Number one, the famous line at the beginning of chapter 19 of Shemot, just before the giving of the Torah, 
where it says, Vayichan Sham Israel Neged Haha, uses the singular and Israel encamped in the singular there opposite the mountain. The famous words of Chazal, echoed by Rashi, Ke'ishechad Belevechad, like one person with one mind. So that enormous sense of unity. The second a pretty explicit statement of this is when Moshe Rabbeinu proposes to the people what God is proposing. V'yanu koha'am yachtav, and all the people answered together and said, all that God has said we will do. So the yachad, there is explicitly in the verse, in verse 8 of this chapter. And then after the revelation, in chapter 24, when Moshe Rabbeinu repeats the terms of the um, of the Torah, Vayan kol ha'am, kol echad, v'yomru, all the people answered with one voice. Now these are pretty unique statements of unity, and all three of them are about the giving of the Torah. So what we have here is three statements of people coming together. So the question is, where do we find the opposite of isolation, of tragedy, of bad things happening, of people being left alone? And the answer is that we find this in Megillat Ruth, in the Megillah that we read on Shavuot, the story of Ruth. Let's just remind ourselves of how that story begins. It begins with five hammer blows of tragedy. First of all, the first verse tells us, maybe may shufot it came to pass in the time when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land. Now a famine in those days was pretty much as severe as an epidemic in our time because without freezers and fridges and supermarkets, a famine was a life-threatening condition. So the first hammer blow, there is a famine. Secondly, a man from Beit Lechem Yehuda, together with his wife and two sons, went to live in the country of Moab. Now, here you have a double tragedy. There's a famine specifically in Beit Lechem in Israel. Beit Lechem means the house of bread. So of all places where you would not wish to have a famine, Beit Lechem is that. And then the man goes, but does not go the way Avram went to Egypt or to Gerar, let's say. He goes to Moab. Moab was Israel's enemy. So here is a family forced out of their own land, out of their own home, to go to the country of their enemies. Then comes the next blow. Elimelech, this man himself, Naomi's husband, dies, and she is left a widow. Then comes the fourth blow. They marry her two sons, Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And Moabite women were not exactly terribly welcome in Israel because these were Israel's enemies. Of course, in the end, one of them turns out to be an exceptional human being. So that is the fourth tragedy. And then comes the fifth tragedy that Machlon and Chilion Naomi's two sons died also. So now you have Ruth left a childless widow and her two daughters-in-law also left childless widows. Three childless widows and you cannot get more vulnerable than that in biblical society because they had no one to support them. Now, we then read of how Naomi hears that there's, again, uh, food in her own land, and she decides to go back. Her two daughters initially accompany her. She says, please don't. There's nothing for you here. I can't give you uh, any more children. Um, go back and get married. And, of course, Orpah does go back, and Ruth refuses and goes with her. She then goes back. The people of the town, the people she knew not that long ago, come and they look at her and they say, can this be Naomi? She has been so shattered by tragedy. 
that people hardly recognize her. And then she replies, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because I eat bitter, because God has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune on me. So that is point number one. We now have a point of contact with a very tragic episode, which left three women exceptionally vulnerable, and one in particular, Naomi, completely isolated, completely devastated. And then we move to the end of the Megillah. At the end of the Megillah, we know what has happened. Boaz, a, dist a kinsman of Naomi, has taken Ruth as a wife, repurchased the family properties. They now have a child, a son, and all the women of the town come and surround them and say, praise be to the Lord who has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. Everyone is rejoicing with Naomi who now has a grandchild. Boaz has a wife. And a child. Ruth has a husband and a child. And the ultimate blessing, the final coup de théâtre at the end of the Megillah, is that the child that they have, called Oved, is the grandfather of David HaMelech, the greatest king of Israel. So we have a situation in which, in the space of four chapters, a story that has moved from isolation, devastation, to one of rejoicing and indeed a kind of renewal of life for all concerned. So the second question is what brings about this change? And the answer is very interesting. There is a um, midrash, Ruth Rabbah, that says, Omar Rabbi Zeira, Rabbi Zeira said, Megillah Zu, this scroll, it contains no laws of any consequence, not pure, impure, permitted, forbidden. Why was it written? To teach you the reward. How great is the reward of those who do acts of kindness? The story of Ruth is the supreme story of kindness in Tanakh. The word itself appears three times in the Megillah, but most importantly, it is Ruth's kindness in staying with Naomi despite all of Naomi's protestations and Boaz's kindness in really realizing what it would take to redeem this family from tragedy. Those two acts of kindness are the causes why the story that begins in tragedy ends in joy. That is the power of chesed, to redeem tragedy and bring joy where there was sadness and hope where there was despair. Now, obviously the question that we ask ourselves is why Ruth is read on Shavuot. There's no obvious connection between Ruth and Shavuot. And the two standard explanations are that number one, it has to do with the time of the year. Ruth is set be made Ketzir Chitim at the time of the wheat harvest. And Shavuot takes place at the time of the wheat harvest. Or number two, that Ruth became a convert. Where you go, I, I go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your God will be my God, your people will be my people. And the Israelites, as it were, became converts at Mount Sinai because the essence of conversion is Kabbalat mitzvot, acceptance of the commands, and that's what the Israelites did at Sinai. So maybe it has to do with time of the year, or maybe it has to do with Ruth's conversion. However, I want to suggest a, a different answer, an answer put forward by none other than Moses Maimonides in the Guide for the Perplexed. The Guide for Perplexed is the greatest work of Jewish philosophy, and it's a big work. 
It consists of three books. It's a very lengthy work. And right at the end, book three has 54 chapters, and right at the end, in chapter 53 of book three, the penultimate chapter, the Rambam devotes one third of that chapter to defining what is chesed, what is loving kindness. And the Rambam says chesed means doing good for people in a way that they have no claim on you. It's not justice, it's not tzedakah, it's chesed. You have no claim, but nonetheless, we do good to somebody. That is chesed, going beyond anything the law requires. And um, in chapter 54, we begin to understand why the Rambam has taken all this time to tell us the meaning of chesed. And in book four, he say, in chapter 54, the closing chapter of the guide, he says, he quotes Jeremiah, who says, Ko Hashem, thus says God, Al yitalel chacham b'chokhmato, let the wise not boast of his wisdom, nor the strong hero of his strength, or the rich person of his wealth, but only boast of this. Think hard, meditate hard, and know me, that I am the Lord, that I am God. Now, this is a very rumbum sort of idea, that the highest thing in life is to develop an intellectual understanding of God. But Jeremiah doesn't stop there. And he goes on and says, Haskev yodoyati ki ani Hashem, ose chesed, mishpat, utztaka ba'aretz. I, says God, do kind, loving kindness, justice and, and righteousness in the, in, on earth. Ki be'ele chofatz di no'ma Hashem. Because these are what I desire, says God. The Rambam says, I may have been giving you the impression that the most important thing in life is to be intellectually understanding of what God is, but actually the most important thing in life is to do acts of loving kindness, justice, and righteousness. It is the kind of people we become and the kind of virtues we embody that what the Torah are all about. And since Ruth is the book of Chesed in Tanakh, Maybe that is why we read it on Shavuot, because the Rambam tells us that the whole purpose of Torah culminates in this ability to do acts of loving kindness to other people. Thus far, the Rambam. However, I want to suggest something else as well and take it just a little bit further. We know what happened at Mount Sinai. The Israelites made a covenant with God. He would be their God and they would be his people. But at key moments in Tanakh, critical moments, we find another phrase altogether. Listen very carefully. Here is Moshe Rabbeinu, here is Moses speaking in the book of Devarim. You shall know that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps habrit v'hachesed, the covenant and the loving kindness. He says it again a few verses later. God will keep the covenant and the loving kindness. When King Solomon dedicated the temple, he uttered the following prayer. Hashem Eloke Yisrael, ain't kamocha alein ba shemaim mu'al ba la'aretz mitochaz. There is no one, no one like you, God, in the heavens above or the earth below. Shomer habrit v'hachesed. Keeping the covenant 
and the loving kindness. And likewise, Nehemiah, when he renews the covenant as the people come back from Babylon, he says, Akel HaGadol HaGibor the God, great, mighty, and awesome God, Shomer HaBrit V'HaChesed. He who keeps the covenant and the loving kindness. Now that's a really puzzling phrase, Habrit V'HaChesed, the covenant and the kindness. So if you look, for instance, at the Jewish Publication Society translation, they just translate covenant because the chesed is included in the covenant. If you look at the new international version, which is a very good non-Jewish translation, Abidva chesed is translated as the covenant of love. But of course, it doesn't mean that. It means covenant and love. Everyone had a problem in understanding what else God does for the Jewish people other than make a covenant with them on Shavuot at Mount Sinai. But if you think about it, the answer is really quite simple. A covenant is what sociologists and anthropologists call reciprocal altruism. You do this for me, I will do this for you. You serve me, says God, and I will protect you. A covenant is always reciprocal and mutual. But that is terribly vulnerable. Because what happens if we don't keep the covenant? The covenant is then rendered null and void. A covenant is not enough. And that's what Moses was saying, that's what King Solomon was saying, that is what Nehemiah was saying. God does not just make a covenant with us. He has a relationship of chesed with us, an unconditional love which is translated in deeds of kindness to us. A covenant is conditional, but chesed is unconditional. That is exactly what the Rambam meant when he said chesed means doing something for somebody who has no claim on us. There's nothing reciprocal about it. And maybe ultimately that is what the book of Ruth is there to show us. The book of Ruth is the book of chesed. And we received a covenant at Mount Sinai, but we also received something much more long-lasting and profound, which is God's unconditional love. And that's what the book is telling us, that God has love for us the way Ruth had for Naomi and Boaz had for Ruth. Acts of loving kindness are what define our relationship with God, and as the book of Ruth shows, they should be what define our relationship with one another. So, Coming back to where we are in the coronavirus crisis, the short answer is that just as in the book of Ruth, tragedy and loneliness and isolation are healed by acts of loving kindness, so have the isolation of so many of us been healed by acts of loving kindness, acts of neighborliness, people being in touch, helping us, getting things for us, phoning us up, connecting us by Zoom, showing that they care about us, those acts of kindness have humanized and, uh, and, 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 and lightened our world. Chesed has a redemptive quality that it transforms tragedy into some form of celebration and despair into some powerful form of hope. Let what Ruth did for Naomi and Boaz did for Ruth be with us in the months ahead as we try and help those who have been so terribly isolated these last weeks and months. And may we remember that as well as giving us a covenant at Mount Sinai, God gave us a bond of love that is unbreakable. He will never abandon us. Let us never abandon him. Chag Chen. Schwartz on Be well. Rabbi Lord Sachs, thank you so much for those beautiful, deep, inspirational words. I certainly have derived so much chizuk from them, and uh, I'm sure so to so many others listening to us right now. And what I would now like to do is to actually dwell more or less on the same theme with very similar messages, but viewing them. Uh, in a slightly different way. 
So we're talking about vertical and horizontal, representing our relationship bein adam lechaveron, bein adam lamakom. And actually, the Decalogue, in terms of its presentation, has a vertical layout and also a horizontal layout. And we traditionally look at the vertical layout to notice that the mitzvot on the right-hand side of Ben Adam Lamakom between ourselves and Hashem, and those on the left-hand side reflect our responsibility, Ben Adam Lachavero between ourselves and our fellow human beings. And in our tradition, we call on people to give equal respect and importance to both sides of the Dibrot. So in Sefer Shmot, Perik Kaftalit, Psukim Vav, Zayn, and Chet. There we find an expression of this. Moshe Rabbeinu is dedicating the Mizbech, the newly assembled and created altar within the Mishkan, the tabernacle in the wilderness. And he has the honor of officiating as the Kohen, so to speak, for that very first offering. So what does Moshe do? Moshe, from the animal that he was sacrificing, took half the blood and he placed it in pans. And the other half he poured over the altar. And then he took the book of the covenant and he read it to the people and they declared everything that Hashem says we will do and then we will understand. And now Moshe returns to the blood. And in Pasuk Chet, we are told, Vayikach Moshe et Adam, Vayizrok al Ha'am. Moshe now took the remaining blood, and he threw it towards the people. Now, we have been told that Moshe took Chatsi Hadam, half the blood. Rashi asks an extraordinary question. Asks Rashi, Mi Chilko. Who divided it for him? Who helped Moshe Rabbeinu to ensure that it would exactly be 50-50, that he would have half on the altar and half towards the people? And Rashi's answer is, Malach ba v'chilko. An angel was sent from heaven to cut the blood in two, so that thanks to the assistance of the angel, Moshe Rabbeinu knew it was 50-50. Now, my question is, if there is going to be a miracle, if Hashem is going to send an angel from heaven to help us, I can think of many good reasons for miracles. But would it really have mattered had it been 51-49 or 52-48? Did it have to be 50-50? Furthermore, Rashi didn't have to actually understand that it was 50-50. Because chatzi doesn't necessarily mean half. Chatzi literally means a portion of. Chatzi halal is not half of halal. Chatzi kaddish is not exactly 50% of kaddish. It's a portion of it. So chatzi hadam could have mean, meant a portion. But Rashi prefers it to be half, and he prefers to describe the miraculous arrival of the angel. The Pachad Yitzchak gives an incredible pairus, says the Pachad Yitzchak. When Moshe took half of the blood, and he poured it on the altar. That was a representation of Ben Adam Lamakom, our responsibility to Hashem, our connection with the Almighty. And when Moshe poured through half the blood towards the people, that reflected our responsibility of Ben Adam Lachaviro to be upright and responsible as far as our fellow human beings are concerned. Hashem sent an angel from heaven to cut it in half in order to ensure that it would be exactly 50-50, that everybody should recognize Ben Atam Lamakom is important and Ben Atam Lachaviro is important. And let no one ever, in any form or fashion, underestimate the significance of our spiritual connection with our Creator and our responsibility towards our fellow human beings. Now, this is not the only way in which we can understand the layout, the presentation, of the Tibrot. Chazal assist us, because they highlight something which is obvious. Commandment number five, to honor your parents, is ben adam the between ourselves and our fellow human beings. And yet it appears on the right-hand side. 
and therefore there can be only one conclusion. When I honor my parents, I'm honoring Hashem. And similarly, when I show responsibility towards my fellows, I am connecting with the Almighty. And there is a most wonderful, marvelous representation of this ideal in Chumash, in Parsha Truma, Shmot, Perek Kafhe, Pasuk Kaf. There, the Torah tells us about the Kruvim, the cherubs, angelic styled, carved out images which were to exist in the Kodesh HaKodeshim, the Holy of Holies, within the Mishkan and later on in the temple. So you had the golden ark, and from the golden lid, the kaporet, they emerged these two golden figures. And the Torah tells us, Vahayu hakrovim, porseich enafayim lemala, sochechim bechanfehem, ala kaporet, ufneihem ish elachiv. So these kruvim were angelic type figures. One had the appearance of a little boy, one of a little girl. They were facing each other and they had wings which were swaying heavenwards. And what we find here is a most remarkable representation. The Kruvim represent our responsibility to look at others face to face with concern and consideration. And at the same time, our wings should spread heavenwards to connect with Hashem in order to teach us that our Ben Adam Lechavero must be an integral part of our Ben Adam Lamakom. It's not 50-50 separate and separate, but rather one is an important element of the other. And this is something HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to teach us with a risk. Because Hashem in the Ten Commandments tells us that we're not allowed to make any images, any three-dimensional figures. And yet he commands us that in the temple itself, in the holiest place on earth, that's where we needed to create such a three-dimensional figure in order to teach us this most important of lessons. The Kruvim represent our responsibility on earth. Always to reach out heavenwards, to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to do his bidding in this world, and to see our concern for others and responsibility towards them as an integral part of our Avodat Hashem. And you have a wonderful expression of this in Sefer Breshit. It's a fascinating Rashi at the beginning of Parshat Vayera. Avram Avinu had just had his Brit Mila. And it was in the heat of the day. And yet despite the pain and the discomfort, he insisted on being out there in order to look out for strangers so that he could bring him, them into his tent in, off, in order with his family to show hospitality. And it was at that very moment, Vayera Elav Hashem, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu appeared to him. In a way, say Chazal, as part of Bikucholim, to visit the one who was sick, to give him chizam. And together with that, Hashem actually had a purpose. He wanted to tell Abraham Abinu that he and Sarai were to be the parents, miraculously, of a child. So Hashem is communicating with Avram. A human being is having such an incredible privilege of an encounter with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And what was Avram Avinu doing at that time? He was lifting up his eyes on the lookout. You know what it's like? You can be at a Kiddush and you're talking to somebody. And while you speak to them, you notice they're looking around to find somebody better to talk to. Now that's exactly what Avram Avinu was doing with none other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem is appearing to him, wants to tell him something, and Avram is on the lookout to do something better, to engage with others. And then he finds the others, and he arises, and he runs after them. And then Avram says, Avram says, Vayomar, Adonai, Yimnamatzatichem beinecha, alnatavor melavdecha. So that's the first way we can read this according to Rashi. That it is my Lord, referring to the most senior of those guests. My Lord, if I found favor in your eyes, please don't pass by. Let me show you hospitality. But there is another way of reading this, says Rashi. It's not Adonai, it's Hashem. It's not my Lord, it's Akadosh Baruch Hu. Avram is now saying to Hashem, Hashem, yes, you're talking to me, but 
Todd, could you just hold on a moment, please? Because, uh, don't leave, just hang on, please, because I have to look after these strangers. And then that's exactly what Avram does. And he prepares the meal with his household, washes their feet, gives them something to eat and drink. Hours later, once he's looked after them adequately, Avram Avinu come back to Hashem. He says, okay, yes, Hashem. So what was it you were talking to me about? And then Hashem tells him about what is going to transpire. And that the cities of Storm and Amorah are going to suffer and so on. How can you explain this? And this is held up for us as an example for us to carry out in our lives, a role model for us to follow. And I believe that is exactly the case because the point here is when we are on the out lookout for fellow human beings to help, it's part of our Avodat Hashem. And when Abram ran towards those strangers, he took HaKadosh Baruch Hu with him. He wasn't leaving Hashem behind. There was no rudeness. Rather, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took pride in one of his creatures who was serving him in such a remarkable way. Because for as long as Avram was engaging with those strangers and showing him their chesed, he was connecting with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in a very deep way and special way. The Ben Adam Lechavera was an integral part of the Ben Adam Lamakko. And we have in the presentation of the Ten Commandments not only a vertical presentation, but also a horizontal one. And let us just share thoughts about the opening pair at the top, five pairs altogether, and the opening pair, Anochi on one side, our belief in Hashem, matched by Lotir Tzach, Thou shalt not murder. And the message here is that if chas v'shalom, a person intends to attack another human being, it amounts to an attack on our creator. And when we show chesed and kindness towards a fellow human being, we are serving our creator. The two must always go hand in hand. So while we engage in our anochi, Looking towards Hashem, Hashem calls on us, Lord Titzach, together with Adam, it's what Ben Adam Lechavirot. Hashem is asking us to be His partners and for us to show that we are responsible. There is a dual expectation running hand in hand together all the time. And we find this in a most marvelous way at the sea. Am Yisrael are fleeing from Mitzrayim, from Egypt. They are caught literally between the Egyptian devil and the deep blue sea. Moshe Rabbeinu does the obvious thing. What would you do if you were Moshe Rabbeinu? He prostrates himself on the ground. He cries out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to help to save the nation. What else can he do? And what is HaKadosh Baruch Hu's response? In Shmot Peret Yodalit, Pasuk Tetvav, chapter 14, verse 15, by Yomer Hashem or Moshe, Hashem says to Moshe, Matitzakelai, why are you crying out to me? Dabero b'nei Yisrael v'yisau, speak to the Israelites, travel. Moshe says, Hashem, this is not a time for prayer. This is a time for action. You're looking to me to help. No, this is a time when I'm looking to you to do something. And if you try to do something, I will join you. Hashem, you open for me the space of the eye of a needle and I'll open for you the space of a hole. But I need your partnership, says Hashem. You can't just leave it all up to me. You can't just have the anuchi, the belief in Hashem to sustain this world. Hashem is looking to us to be his partners. So having heard that, Moshe Rabbeinu got up. He spoke to the nation. He told them what Hashem had said. He said, we need to find a strategy. And then Nachshon thought, okay, I'll try this out. And he, with his leap of faith, came into the waters. The people followed, and the rest is all history. Rashi points out in Sefer Bamidbar that Moshe Rabbeinu learned this lesson that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had taught him later on. When his sister was so ill from leprosy, he feared she might die. And Moshe there prays the shortest prayer on record. 
Kale na rafa na la. God, please heal her, please. Five short staccato type words. He couldn't have been shorter than that. This was a time for prayer to connect with Hashem. But he remembered this was also to be a time for him to sit by his sister's bedside, for him to look for medical help, for him to engage in constructive action because Hashem would be looking to him to be the partner of our creator at that time. I cannot, cannot recall a time when this partnership between HaKadosh Baruch Hu and humanity has been so necessary. We refer to two concepts. We refer to Bitachon and Hishtadlut. Bitachon is our faith, our trust in the Almighty. Hishtadlut is what we should be doing, our strategy for success. While we engage in Bitachon, turning to Hashem, Hashem calls on us to utilize our powers and talents of Hishtadlut. And that's what the coronavirus is calling upon us to do right now. First of all, to have bitachon, to turn heavenwards, to daven as we've, as we've never daven before, to say to Hillel, to engage in spiritual activities, to turn heavenwards, and to pray that HaKadosh Baruch Hu should help ourselves, should help our people, should help all of humankind at this very challenging time. And at the same time, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is looking to us, and he's saying, this is the call of the hour for you to do something. What we should be doing is to take the necessary steps to safeguard our health. And in so doing, to safeguard the health and the well-being and to protect the lives of those around us. And as a society at large, to develop medications, to try to develop that vaccine, to see what we can do in order to help. And now that we know that the call of the hour is this partnership between Bitachon and Hishtadlut, we can, with great pain and difficulty, but nonetheless we can keep away from our shuls, not enjoy the privilege of Tefillah B'Tzibah davening in Aminia as we usually have, because we know that what we're doing is for a great purpose. As Hashem commands us to look after our lives and the lives of others. And I have been so inspired by Jewish communities right around the world who with such enormous difficulty are davening at home, existing at home. It's not easy staying away from shul. It's not easy with social distancing, but we are doing it because that is our hishtadlut that HaKadosh Baruch Hu calls upon us to do. It's the two arms of Aseret Adibrot working together, us turning heavenwards to Hashem and Hashem turning to us in order to help. This coming Shavuot will, as Rabbi Lord Sachs said, be a combination of everybody coming together, feeling that sense of connection, as we're reminded of the Vayichan, as we encamped, at the foot of the mountain, like one person with one heart. And at the same time, we are alone. And in so doing, we are carrying out the will of Hashem. I want to conclude with a beautiful Tvatara. The question I want to pose to you is about the timing of the festival of Shavuot. Shavuot, of course, is the anniversary of the day on which we received the first luchot, the first tablets. What happened to those tablets? Moshe Rabbeinu smashed them into pieces when he saw the nation worshipping the golden calf. Then he went up to the mountain a second time, and then he came down again on the 10th of Tishrei. That's why it was a Yom HaKippurim, a day of atonement, when the people now on the second occasion were not worshipping idolatry. They received the tablets as they should have. And those tablets were, the sh were shalem, they were whole. So let's ask this question. Why do we celebrate Shavuot on the anniversary of the receipt of the first tablets? These were the tablets of disappointment. These were the tablets which reflect what shouldn't have happened. Surely we should celebrate Zman Matan Torah the receiving of the giving of the, the giving of the Torah. 
at the time of the second giving of the tablets. Rabbi Tzalel HaKohen of Vilna, who was the Rebbe of the Chofetz Chaim, gives a beautiful answer. He refers to the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, Avchet Amutbet, which tells us, Luchot v'shivrei luchot munachin be'aron. Once we had an Ark of the Covenant, both the whole tablets and also the broken pieces of the first tablets were contained therein. Moshe Rabbeinu stooped down and he picked up those pieces. And those pieces were in the Aron as well, together with the whole tablets. So says Rabbi Tzalel HaKohen. What we need to remember is that the Shivrei Luchot, the fragments of tablets, have the potential to attain the same Kedusha, the same level of holiness as the whole tablets. I believe that that's a message for us right now. This Shavuot will be a festival of disappointment. We'll be remembering the Tikkun Lel within the community and in yeshivas and in places of learning that we should have been having and that we can't have. We'll be remembering the services together that we could enjoy, but alas, they're not there for us to enjoy. It will be a time of disappointment. And we will be in fragments, pieces, each in our own homes, scattered around the world. However, we celebrate Shavuot at this time to recognize opportunity. Because fragments of disappointment can provide an incredible opportunity for Kiddush Hashem. For the same Kiddush that can be attained through being Shalem as a people. And it is this type of Zoom communication, the proliferation of Divrei Torah, a festival of Torah learning, which I see and witness and which we're all part of globally right now, which has been produced by this crisis, and which Yimit Hashem will continue well beyond it to increase Torah learning, to increase our thirst for community life, to deepen our Jewish roots, and to strengthen our connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Always remembering that our responsibility to our Ben Adam our horizontal responsibility, must always be seen as an integral part of the vertical responsibility, our responsibility towards our Creator. I wish you all Chag Sameach and Yimitzay Hashem through being the Shivrei Luchot around the world. May we, through our Hishtatlut, through all of our efforts, attain great heights so that this year the Luchot that we'll have will be just as great as the regular Luchot, im lo lemala mizeh, if not even greater. Chag Sameach.